Step of the business is a motion to approve a statutory rule. I ask the clerk to read the motion. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 be approved. I now call on Junior Minister Declan Kearney to formally move the motion. And Rune Shaw, a horch con Ken. Thank order, you, order. Mr. Speaker. Seeing clearly that you're going to move the motion, that's some more uh, advice to give to members, and then you'll be allowed to uh, take the floor. So, do you wish to move the motion? Basically, what I was in the process of doing, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So, I beg to move. Goramaygat. Thank you. The Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit to this debate. I'd also like to remind members that the Business Committee has agreed that under the current circumstances, members may rise in their place if they wish to be called to speak during debate uh, or any other occasion. <coughs> this is the usual way of getting your name onto the speaker's list, uh, is also to inform the Business Committee or by approaching the top table. These remain uh, valid alternative options. I now call the Minister to open the debate on the motion. Minister. It is now some eight weeks since it became necessary for the Executive and for this Assembly to introduce the extraordinary measures which have so drastically affected the way we live our lives and go about our business. There has been no other legislation in living memory which has caused so much disruption. Life as we know it has been turned on its head. It has separated people from family and loved ones who happen to live in different households. Businesses have been closed and economic activity paused. The regulations have stopped us from going beyond our homes, except for limited purposes. So, a short piece of legislation, which, like the tiny microbe whose name is in the title of our regulations, has had serious and far-reaching consequences beyond which any of us could ever have imagined. However, that is where any comparison ends, because, of course, unlike the coronavirus itself, the health protection coronavirus restrictions, regulations, have in fact saved lives. Only weeks ago, we were preparing for the prospect of 15,000 deaths in the north and then a reasonable worst-case scenario of 1,500 fatalities. These regulations have protected our health and care services, and they have helped preserve societal well-being. They are a key to help us lift the lockdown. COVID-19 has wreaked a terrible havoc upon us, and, very sadly, for many people, that has meant the loss of a loved one. My heart goes out to all of those who have lost family and friends. Currently, up to 482 have died here in the north, as well as in excess of 2,029 souls on our island and tens of thousands of lost lives in both Britain and Ireland. And I am sure that I speak for everyone in this chamber in saying that our thoughts and sincere sympathies go out to all of those who have been bereaved and are suffering the pain of loss at this time. I send good wishes to those lucky enough to be out of danger and have begun their recovery, including personal and family friends of my own. And I do extend solidarity to all of our health and social care heroes and many other key workers who have been on the front line in the fight back against COVID-19. Is Kush Jema Dusa nach wohl in Rechak Kamshihak Efak Takar and Galar Shaw er file doing Lahra? And it is an unfortunate reality we face that we are in the midst of a major pandemic health emergency for which there are in fact at this point in time no quick fixes or ready made solutions. But we can be sure of this. We are going to be managing this emergency for some considerable time to come. We are unlikely to see 
a return to a new normal way of living in the short to midterm. And that means that we have to accept the fact that we'll, we will be living with the threat of this virus in our midst for some time. We will need to keep managing our behaviours to minimise the risks of spreading the infection. These are, alas Concordia, extraordinary times. And to get through them will necessitate the continuation of extraordinary measures, to some extent at least. On Tuesday last week, the Executive published a document which seeks to strategically chart a way through the crisis. And that is a route with passing points, which we will only cross through when the science says that it is safe and right to do so. I'll say a bit more about the Executive's plan in a moment, Elias Kionkorlia, but first of all I want to return to the motion before us this afternoon. I'd like to, remember members, re like to re remind members of proceedings on the 21st of April, when the Assembly considered and approved the original regulations, which of course had been made using emergency provisions in the primary legislation. And these were made and came into operation on the 28th of March in the knowledge that democratic scrutiny by this Assembly would have to follow afterwards. And this approach was brought about solely to do with the urgent prevailing circumstances. The content of the regulations is, of course, something we are all now quite familiar with. There are three main aspects. Firstly, they impose restrictions on businesses, and many have had to close altogether. Secondly, there are restrictions on gatherings of more than two people other than in certain exceptional circumstances. And thirdly, there are restrictions on movement, with no one allowed to leave home without a reasonable excuse. There are also provisions for enforcement and penalties ranging from fixed penalty notices to fines of up to £5,000 on summary conviction. Ganaurus is relaha trom kushacha eid shaw, agus fear duhlana duinya galier. The regulations contain very serious measures which have far-reaching implications for every single person. And we, as elected representatives, bear a heavy responsibility for ensuring that they are kept under constant review so that they are not retained one day longer than is absolutely necessary. The importance of that was recognised from the outset, and the regulations have built-in protections to ensure that there are frequent and robust reviews of all of the measures. Regulation 2, paragraph 2, requires that the restrictions and requirements are reviewed at least once every 21 days. Regula Regulation 2, paragraph 3, requires that any restrictions or requirements must be terminated as soon as the Department of Health considers that they are no longer necessary. And these are powerful legislative protections. And since the 28th of March, when the regulations were first introduced, they have provided the basis for several reviews conducted by the Executive. A first review, completed on the 15th of April 2020, resulted in no changes. Then, on the 24th of April, it was agreed that the requirement to close burial grounds to members of the public should in fact be lifted. It was also agreed that it would be helpful when doing so to clarify the circumstances in which a person may leave the place where they are living to take exercise. Following a further review on the 7th of May, it was decided to continue to maintain all of the remaining restrictions and requirements for the time being. Then last Thursday, following publication of the Executive's approach document, the Executive announced the easing of other restrictions in the context of taking another cautious step towards the new normal. And as a result, garden centres and ornamental plant nurseries may be open to customers. Marriage ceremonies can take place where one of the partners or an immediate family member is terminally ill. And thirdly, household recycling centres can open. And yesterday, on the basis of the latest scientific evidence and expert advice, a number of other easements were agreed. For instance, up to six people, not from the same household, may now meet outdoors. Churches may open for private prayer, 
and some sports such as golf and tennis can recommence. Drive-in church services, cinemas and concerts are also to be permitted. These changes will be reflected in further amending regulations which it is hoped will be made later today. And they do demonstrate, Alias Concordia, the executive commitment to reviewing the regulations and they signal our determination to act decisively when the evidence and advice shows that the time is right. However, it is the changes made following the review on the 24th of April that led to the amendment regulations which are the subject of today's debate. Those changes, easing of restrictions around access to burial grounds and additional clarity around travelling to take exercise, were arrived at through sound, proportionate, careful judgments by the executive. And all of that was governed by the expert advice from the chief medical officer and the chief scientific officer. I'll ask John Corley, these were judgments based on striking the right balance between citizens' mental health and well-being and making sure that people are not put at risk from transmissions of coronavirus. And that is a judgment which takes into consideration the very real comfort that being able to visit the graveside of a loved one brings to people. And it was also a judgment which recognised further clarification was needed to help people make the right decisions to meet the rules governing restrictions on movement. The amendment regulations give effect to those simple but important changes. The actual amendments are as follows. Firstly, Regulation 4, which deals with restrictions and closures, is amended to remove the requirement to close burial grounds to members of the public. A new regulation, 4A, was added to ensure that adherence to social distancing rules by those visiting burial grounds were applied. And this regulation imposes a duty on a person who is responsible for a burial ground to take all reasonable measures to ensure that a distance of at least two metres is observed between every person at the burial ground except between members of the same household. In addition, Lias Concordia, Regulation 5, which deals with the restrictions on movement, is therefore amended to include the need to visit a burial ground to pay respects to a member of a person's household, a family member or friend, as a reasonable excuse for a person to leave the place where they are living. And finally, Regulation 5 is also amended to clarify the circumstances in which a person may leave the place where they are living to take exercise by providing for reasonable travel to exercise. Alias Concordia, these amendments mark small but significant and important steps on the path to recovery. These and others in the future will be made by taking account of the ongoing critical situation whilst giving hope for the future. None of us want the restrictions to remain for one moment longer than is necessary. Citizens, communities and businesses are suffering and people are having to make huge, huge personal sacrifices as a result of these regulations. However, it is important to emphasise that the regulations are key to winning the fight against COVID-19. They are essential means by which to fight back against the pandemic. And they need to be taken in context with the executive's five-step plan, adherence to best international guidance, and the need to implement a programme of universal community testing, contact tracing and isolation. And importantly, a whole of government and whole of society partnership and this integrated approach, which represents our effective recovery roadmap to move towards a return to more normal ways. So we should be absolutely clear about this. The regulations are working, Elias Concordia. Ta Egiri Yo. They have saved lives. In fact, they have saved a great many lives. And they have prevented our health system from being overwhelmed. And aided by the comprehensive guide published by the executive last Tuesday, we are now beginning to see a slow pathway to recovery unfold. 
The guide identifies three essential criteria for consideration in the Executive's ongoing reviews of the regulations. Firstly, evidence and analysis relating to the pandemic. And that will include the latest medical and scientific advice, an adherence to World Health Organization guidelines, the estimated level of transmission within society, and the impact that any regulations may have on the future trajectory of the pandemic. Secondly, the capacity of the health and social care services in our society to deal with coronavirus cases, whilst also returning delivery of normal services. And thirdly, assessment of wider health, societal and economic impacts of the regulations, including the identification of areas where we can secure greatest benefit and lowest risk as a result of any relaxations. Alias Concordia, the approach of our five-party power-sharing government is logical and measured. It provides for decisions to be made based upon science and expert advice, with room enough for common sense. But make no mistake, we remain in a critical situation. Our public health message has not changed. Stay at home and save lives. What the executive will not countenance in reviewing the regulations is being rushed into making premature, reckless or uninformed decisions, whether as a result of artificial deadlines or simply to match actions which are taking place in other jurisdictions. The clear scientific assessment is that the pathway of the pandemic is on the island. It makes sense to develop common approaches. The executive has a duty to give clear leadership, alias Concordia. Ni more doing kyanarak yanunach agasalyer a feimnu amahancho. So the executive will do what is right, in the right sectors, at the right time for our citizens, exercising the sort of good judgment that has been apparent in all of the reviews to date. Our commitment to all we serve is to succeed by continuing to save lives and protect public health. But I can call you, this is a marathon, not a sprint. The small changes we are debating today are an example of the Executive's careful judgment, and I therefore commend the regulations to the Assembly. Mullum Narelaha, Guramaigat. First, I'd like to welcome our newest Assembly member to the Chamber, uh, Cara Hunter. And now, can we have Colin McGrath, the Chief Executive Office Committee Chair? Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I rise to speak on behalf of the Executive Committee. Um, the Committee very much welcomes these regulations, and I look forward to hearing from the Chairperson of the Health Committee on the formal deliberations that took place around the legislation. Members of the Executive Office Committee were acutely aware of the relief that was felt across the North when it was announced that cemeteries would reopen. And in that context, uh, I want to briefly reflect on what it does mean to some people to visit a cemetery. For many, it is an important part of the grieving process. It is an acknowledgement that the deceased has not been forgotten and is still very much part of their lives. I am sure I was not alone in my sympathy for bereaved relatives who were so distressed about not being able to visit the gravesides of their loved ones. It was particularly heartbreaking to listen to those who were recently bereaved talk about the devastating effect the closures were having on their mental health and their ability to cope with the loss. For them, the reopening of cemeteries was an incredible comfort and a great joy at a time of such sadness. Of course, you don't have to be recently bereaved to feel the effects of the closures. Many people visit graveyards for reflection and to experience the solitude and sense of calm a cemetery can offer at times of distress or anxiety. 
and I think that is why the closures had a, such an impact on so many. Nearly everyone is living through some level of distress or anxiety because of the current pandemic. But in welcoming the reopening of the cemeteries, I also want to stress the importance of maintaining social distance, regardless of where you are. Social distancing will play a major role in creating the right environment where further restrictions can be lifted and we can be begin to inch closer to what we see as a normal way of life. We are seeing evidence of that already with the reopening of garden and household recycling centres. Those centres could only reopen because of the impact social distancing is having on the reproduction rate of the virus. So I urge everyone to show discipline and compliance, and I look forward to the lifting of further restrictions, but only when it is safe to do so. I would now like to make a number of points in my capacity as an MLA for South Down. We are seeing frequent changes to these regulations, and that is to be expected. And I welcome that we are able to move uh, towards normality, or the new normality, as it will be known. I would urge, though, as much clarity as possible. After every announcement, I am sure all members across the House see their inboxes light up with various questions and queries and requests to find out about individual bespoke cases. I would urge where you can not to use generalised terms such as sports or open spaces or businesses without clarifying what that will mean for people. In some cases, it builds up hope, only for that hope to be dashed whenever the clarification is sought. Also, I would urge, as is a recurring theme and one that needs to be developed, is what we can do for our over 70s and those that are shielding, leaving them no hope in every announcement and just saying that you'll have to stay at home isn't going to cut it with them. We need to champion their cause uh, so that they can have a social outlet, some communication with others, or we will be storing up a problem for the future with health and mental health being impacted. They are feeling the pain of isolation, and it is only fair that we respond to that pain and do what we can to help and give them hope. I have had calls too from people asking that the medical advice and guidance is published as well. People want to believe everything that they are hearing, but some are struggling. And if we are to be a truly open and transparent government and executive, I would ask that the guidance and support is fully published. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I now call on the Health Committee Chair, Colin Gilgenew. The Hoos data a ver don chak, the swing chak, and costa slancha, a horch fui na shrenta. I rise to update the House on the Health Committee's consideration of the regulations. The Health Committee was briefed on the 30th of April by the Chief Environmental Health Officer and was advised of the two main purposes mentioned by the Junior Minister to amend previous regulations to facilitate the opening of cemeteries and to clarify the rules around leaving home for the purposes of taking exercise. The Department explained that due to the urgency of the situation, it was not possible to bring an SL1 to committee in advance of laying the statutory rule. The committee raised two issues in relation to the SR. First, health protection in cemeteries, and secondly, the requirements of those with autism or complex needs. On the issue of cemeteries, the Department advised that the responsibility for the protection of workers and visitors rests with those who manage the site and that some may choose not to open if they feel they can't meet public requirements. In relation to the revised description of the rule around exercise, the committee was advised that the amendment clarifies that travel for exercise may be reasonable in certain circumstances, whereas the regulations don't specifically mention those with autism or disabilities. The Chief Environmental Health Officer advised us that revised Cabinet guidance of 8 of April covered those matters providing for extra flexibility for those with medical conditions. He also confirmed that the PSNA have been taking that into account in applying the reasonableness test. The committee was further advised that the department is aware of the fact that whereas the guidance refers to exercise in line with a care plan, not all of those with complex needs actually have a care plan in place, and that work was ongoing to address that situation. 
The junior minister may be able to confirm any progress on that and whether it has been communicated to the PSNI. The Chief Environmental Health Officer also advised that work was almost completed on a draft template letter which could be requested by families from their local trust to carry with them, confirming that a member of the family has particular needs which require travel or exercise. And again, it would be good to hear if that has been advanced or progressed. That for those with autism and complex needs, the issue was wider indeed than the need for exercise. It was put to the Department that going out for a drive in itself can be part of a wider approach to cure and management of challenging behaviour, as it can be a calming mechanism and a coping strategy, a way to prevent self-harm or harm to others. Further to a suggestion that it would be helpful to confirm that families trying to cope in such difficult circumstances would not be penalised. The CEHO said he would feed that back to the Learning Disability Unit and see if something could be done, although he also said that the PSNA are aware and are taking into account individual circumstances. The committee agreed that it was content with the statutory rule, subject to the report from the examiner of statutory rules. The examiner has now reported on the SR and has raised no issues. I'll ask Jan Corlea, boy, a couple of fakal ara anish mar... Urbalri Schlanche Sinn Féin Fosta. I'd now like to say a few words to Sinn Féin spokesperson for health. The health protection regulations that came into effect on 20th of March this year have undoubtedly saved lives across the north. In the face of the unprecedented challenge that the COVID-19 virus presents to our very way of life, from the way we work to the way we interact with loved ones, and even, sadly, the way we say goodbye, the executive has introduced measures that have altered our whole society while protecting health and social care services. The COVID-19 virus has brought unthinkable worry, pain and grief to all our communities. To all that have lost a loved one, a neighbour, a friend, I offer my sincere condolences. Through strict observance of the regulations, through much personal sacrifice and hard work on the part of our communities, we have reached a stage where a careful easement of the restrictions is possible. It is hoped that as we move through the next weeks and months, we can safely lift and ease more lockdown measures, noting as we go that this virus is no more a respecter of timelines than it is of borders. However, every easement of the lockdown must be guided first and foremost by scientific and medical evidence. Any relaxation of the guidance of the restrictions must be in accordance with the World Health Organization's guidance that one, transmission of the disease is under control. Two, health and social care services have the capacity to test, trace and treat every case and to trace every contact of the COVID patient. Three, our health service has the capacity to cope with the second wave of the virus with adequate PPE, ventilators and so forth in place. Crucially, nursing homes and other hotspot risks are identified and the risks within those settings minimised. The risk of important new cases can be managed. August Evereshe, number six, for Yeru, Akharian, Niela, Goginian, Midge, or Bubble, or Anolis, August Godaki, and Mwij, Lya, Mar, Iskiart. That all of our community, including harder to reach communities, are engaged, informed, and supported appropriately at this time and as we move through these measures. Our relaxation of the restrictions must be carefully crafted so as to allow flexibility to change course when needed. Ni mor dargenci ave tomoisti agus olak agus ave janta derer na kuniola eggshula in our bubble agus derer na tira olaikta. Our decisions at this important time must be measured and informed and done in a way that suits the particular circumstances of our own communities and our own geography. I call Pam Cameron. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. And uh, can I just put on record my thanks to um, both the First and Deputy First Minister and the Junior Ministers, and indeed the, the Health Minister, as they continue to work through this very difficult period. While we focus now on the relaxation of restrictions, it would be wrong for us not to once again express our deepest sympathy to those who mourn the loss of a loved one to this awful disease. We know now almost 490 families in Northern Ireland have been left devastated, and it is a heartbreaking statistic. 
but behind each one of those is someone loved and missed. And our thoughts and prayers remain with these families now and in the days ahead. Mr Deputy Speaker, the decision to relax restrictions and amend these regulations does not come easy. It is always vital that these decisions are determined by the best scientific and medical advice. Politics must not come into it, just evidence. In this regard, I want to tri pay tribute to the expert advisers we have here in Northern Ireland, not least our Chief Medical Officer. Thank you for all you're doing at this time. As MLAs, we are today and daily being contacted with the question, am I allowed to? It is the question on everyone's lips. When will we be able to? And for family life, for community life, for the return to what we once called normal. In recent weeks, we have all taken small steps. Access to cemeteries was a much needed and most welcome first step. Who among us did not have a constituent who longed to visit the grave of a loved one lost too soon? Maybe a child or a spouse. The stories received no doubt have had real impact on us all personally, and I'm glad that today those graves can be visited. We must also thank our funeral directors and undertakers for their work in recent weeks. It has been incredibly difficult, but as always, they have carried out their duty, and that has been with compassion and care, and we welcome that. In the coming weeks, I'm hopeful that we can see an increase in the number of people allowed out at the graveside during a funeral, and I would encourage the executive to explore how this could be allowed. Mr Deputy Speaker, I also commend my colleague Evan Putz for his actions as Dear Minister in handling the opening of recycling centres in conjunction with the local councils, but also the recent announcement to permit angling. Yesterday's announcement that outside gatherings of up to six people can take place is very welcome, and I emphasise that social distancing remains key along with not sharing hard surfaces. As indeed is the opening of places of worship for private prayer and for drive-in worship. Necessarily small steps, Mr Deputy Speaker, but steps in the right direction. It is important in the coming days that we continue on the roadmap to recovery set out by the Executive. At all times, this must be balanced by the safety to take each step. We must keep the R number down. So the message remains the same. Stay at home as much as you possibly can. Wash your hands. Keep two metres apart. And if we do not heed these rules, we risk going backwards in terms of these steps. These steps will save lives and enable society to take steps forward. The people of Northern Ireland can be rightly proud of how they have responded to the public health messages issued over recent weeks. And if we all continue to do this, we will save lives and continue to progress back to normal or a new normal. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister Kearney uh, has not been shy on occasion uh, to make the odd political comment uh, during the course of the pandemic. Uh, so I would like to make a political point uh, today. After all, his party colleague, uh, John O'Dowd, reminded us recently this is a political chamber. Uh, and the point, very simply, is this. Given we are part of the National Health Service, uh, and given the eye-watering amounts of additional money coming our way from Treasury uh, beyond the block grant, then I hope every member uh, could agree with me that, irrespective of their legitimate constitutional aspiration, there has never been a better time for Northern Ireland to be part of the United Kingdom. And that will need to be factored into any debate on new norms. I call John Blair. Mr Deputy Speaker, thank you. Uh, I would like, on behalf of Alliance, to uh, thank the ministers for their statement today uh, on previous amendments to the regulations and thank them and the rest of their executive colleagues also for the further information released yesterday, which would have brought some hope and reassurance to many people. We are reminded, especially at a time when some people are benefiting from reassurance, that there is still much suffering and anxiety in our communities. Deputy Speaker, stress about the road ahead and, of course, grief for those who have lost loved ones, and we are thinking of all of those people today. It is right that we should also reflect today on the huge effort made by people right across Northern Ireland to follow advice, adhere to regulations, and join together to save lives and protect our health and frontline services. 
It is that effort which has allowed some relaxation of the regulations that have been put in place. Oh, of course, Deputy Speaker, a limited alleviation of regulations, just like every other public announcement, will bring further questions. There will be questions about whether it is safe to gather in a particular open space. There might be questions asking that if a fishery is open, as announced on late night television, then is the forest park around that fishery open also? We know that acceding to every request could fragment a coordinated approach to to battling this virus. That could then lead to an ad hoc development of policy, create uncertainty and could have the most serious of consequences, especially if any lack of cohesion was to lead to a second wave of coronavirus. Perhaps then in the response today, the junior ministers will give us their thoughts on two things. Firstly, the need for clear and consistent messaging from every minister and every department so that information is presented from where and when it is expected and comes as far as is possible with as clear a guidance that, that can accompany it. Secondly, that we assist the public in developing a common sense approach to implementing the regulations by reviewing and, if necessary, refreshing the messaging that is out there to ensure that we are maximising the audience and holding public attention at all times as things change. We know that challenges to police work, for example, in implementing the regulations are ongoing as witnessed in Belfast in recent days at the Oval Tower and on other occasions. Every effort must therefore be made to assist police in their duty. I am pleased to hear that processes are being put in place to, so that local councils can assist with enforcement matters, and I look forward to receiving more information about that when the latest uh, updates and amendments are before us, if not before then. Um, I, Deputy Speaker, and my colleagues are, like all others, looking forward to better times, and we are willing to continue efforts guided by scientific and medical advice to get us there. So, in that light, we are content to support the regulations as amended. I call Christopher Stelford. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Before I go into my remarks, could I also associate myself with yours in welcoming the new member for East London Derry to this chamber? It was my great privilege to preside over her signing the book. I'm sure she'll have a good time here, or at least I hope she does. We all try to. Um, so I, I wish her all the best. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, a free people cannot be expected to live under house arrest indefinitely. And we voted for the government to have huge and wide ranging powers eight weeks ago. In a free society, these provisions do not sit comfortably with those who believe in individual, property or collective general rights. Our people have endured serious curtailments of their rights in the name of controlling the threat of this virus. The success of the science-led approach is measurable in the fact, as was said by the junior minister, in the fact that at the commencement of this crisis, this House was told that we were facing into the very real possibility of up to 15,000 deaths in this part of the United Kingdom. Now, every death is a tragedy, and I want to extend my deepest sympathies to the families of the 482 people who have lost their life as a result of this virus. Because of the perseverance of our people, this dreadful virus is soon sorry, I beg your pardon. This dreadful virus is coming under control, and the terror that it unleashed in all of us eight weeks ago has mercifully not been realized. However, we need to be clear and we need to be honest. Patience is starting to run thin within the wider public. And we need to face into that. Others have talked about the need for clear messaging, and I absolutely associate myself with that. It is important that there is a clear and consistent message coming from the executive at this time. But as I said in the introductory element of my comments, a free people will not consent to live under house arrest forever, least of all in a country like ours, which is the foundation stone, the, the, the founding country of liberal democracy, and where freedom means so much. There are some questions 
that I want answered, particularly in the context of the mixed messaging that people have been talking about. I would like to know from the government what the R rate presently is. I would also like to know from the government, has a figure been established as what an R rate should look like to enable a more full-blown relaxation of these draconian laws? I would like to know who has provided that figure, if one exists. I would like to know if that figure is 0.5, as has been quoted by the Deputy First Minister widely in the press. If that figure that has been provided to the government is not 0.5, then where did the Deputy First Minister get her figure from? These are important questions. And if we're going to reassure our frightened people, then these need to be answered here today. I want to raise the issue of churches. I welcome the announcement that has been made in terms of churches being able to use car parks for drive-in facilities. The member will know, uh, the minister will know, that I'm a member of Ravenhill Presbyterian Church, a church in inner city Belfast. We don't have a car park, but we have an enormous building. And I'm looking around, and I would suspect the interior of our building is bigger than this chamber. But my congregation is being told, you can't meet, but here we sit. It's important that the messages that we send out have logic attached to them. And I think that is something that does need to be addressed. I welcome the relaxation around cemeteries. Uh, this is something that I, I feel very strongly about. Uh, my father died when I was seven. And on the day that I got married, I went to his grave. On the day that I was elected to the council for the first time, I went to his grave. On the day that I was elected here, for the first time, I went to his grave. It's an important place for me. And I absolutely understand, therefore, why it's so important for people to have that uh, in their lives. I welcome the measures that have been announced in terms of marriages. I think that is the compassionate and the right thing to do. I think that overall, we can say that the government has acted wisely and judiciously, but I think that our people are looking for answers. At the start of this, eight weeks ago, there was a need to impress upon the people the scale of the threat posed. Now, our frightened and cowed people need to be given hope. Thank you. I call Pat Sheehan. And the last time I spoke on these regulations, I was clear that uh, as a political representative, under normal circumstances, I would never want to introduce restrictions on people's uh, freedom of movement in the way these regulations do. But uh, as we all know, we're living in extraordinary times. And even in the past four weeks, the context has shifted uh, uh, slightly. But I've no doubt that lives have been saved as a result of the measures that were implemented. And I welcome the fact that there has been some relaxation of restrictions in terms of some outdoor activities. And it is clear from the executive approach to decision making what needs to happen before there is further easing of restrictions. For now, the focus must be on a strategy to minimise harm from ill-advised relaxation of physical distance and distancing in ways that will trigger further epidemic spikes. So I commend the executive for closely following the advice of the World Health Organization when setting out their own guiding principles for considering whether a specific restriction or requirement should be retained, withdrawn or modified. Those principles are clear and easily understood. Of course, it's right that we should follow the guidance of the World Health Organization, since it is the organization that has the most experience in fighting uh, previous epidemics such as SARS, MERS uh, and Ebola. But more importantly, it's those countries that closely followed 
World Health Organization adv advice who have been most successful in controlling the spread of COVID-19. There's been quite a lot of black backslapping here by people who believe we have done well in tackling the virus. And that may well be true in comparison to uh, our neighboring island, Italy or Spain. But let's have a look at South Korea, a country with a population of 51 million. Seoul, the capital city, is only a two-hour flight from Wuhan, where this virus is alleged to have started. And they did not have uh, the same restrictive lockdown that we have experienced here. But they did have a first-class system to carry out widespread community testing and contact tracing. And they tested and traced the virus until they had it under control. Despite some new clusters, the Koreans have managed to keep it in check. There have only been 263 deaths, and not one of those deaths has been in a care home. Not one of those deaths has been in a care home. The Health and Social Care Committee in Westminster heard recently from a research fellow at London School of Economics that anyone in care homes in South Korea with suspected COVID was immediately isolated and if they tested positive were removed to quarantine centres or hospitals. And she finished her evidence by saying not a single person has died with COVID in a South Korean care home. In contrast here, with a population of just 1.8 million, we have had around 500 deaths, depending on which data you read. And almost half of those deaths have been among the frail and the elderly in care homes. Of course, the Koreans were prepared for this virus, and we were not. Uh, many will say Koreans had previous experience of dealing uh, with previous viruses like SARS and MERS. So they were much more prepared than we were here. Of course, the weakness of preparations was exposed in October 2016 by exercise sickness, a pandemic simulation, and the necessary remedial steps were not taken. If anything, the state of preparedness has worsened since 2016 as a direct result of underfunding to the NHS and public health infrastructure. So what needs to happen next? The World Health Organization, as quoted in the executive document, are quite clear. Transmission must be controlled. There must be capacity to detect, trace, isolate, and treat every case, and trace every contact. Outbreak risks must be minimized in special settings like health, facil health facilities and nursing homes. And I have to express some serious concerns about the health department being able to meet these criteria. Can I bring the member back to the legislation we're discussing here? I am allowing considerable latitude to all members, but please do mention the specific relaxation legislation, which is under debate. Uh, and of course, the legislation is related to the situation on the ground uh, and in terms of relaxation of measures. It's important we know what has to happen and what criteria have to be met. There are still serious problems uh, with the rate of transmission in care homes, as well as concern about the infrastructure being put in place to carry out contact tracing. So let me deal with contact tracing first. On March the 12th, a decision was taken in London to end contact tracing. For some reason, the same decision was taken here despite the fact that the two situations and the two contexts were entirely different. We're told the decision here was made on the basis of scientific advice from experts in the field and sound public health considerations. However, we couldn't interrogate that advice. It's secret. It's not transparent. We don't know who the scientists were who offered the advice, and that is not acceptable. Last Thursday, we had three eminent experts giving evidence to the Health Committee. Professor Anthony Costello totally dismissed and disagreed with the assertion that the decision to end community testing 
and contact tracing could have been based on sound public health considerations. Professor Costello's view chimes with the World Health Organization advice and best international practice. And some will say, don't look back, let's move forward. That's fair enough. I'm not here Can to Can I ask the member, blame. is he going to comment on the legislation in yes. front of us today? If he is so, please reference it yes. shortly. Thank you, Corla. Uh, and that's fair enough, but we need to learn from previous mistakes and make sure that we don't repeat them. So have we now got in place a proper system for contact tracing? Well, the chief executive of the PHA told the committee on April the 16th, and Jim Wells made mention of this when he was asking the Health Minister a question last week at the Ad Hoc Committee, that 500 people had been recruited and were currently being trained to carry out contact tracing. Three weeks later, on May the 7th, when she again gave evidence to the committee and was questioned by myself, she admitted that there weren't 500 people being trained. There weren't 500 people recruited and there weren't 500 being trained. So why did she feel she could come to the committee and give that evidence in the first place? And we're now told by the minister that there are actually only 58 people who have currently been trained to carry out contact tracing. We know contact tracing was happening initially uh, at, the at the start of this outbreak. We don't know how many were involved, but for only now, for 58, for only 58 people to be trained in contact, tra in contact tracing seems totally inadequate to me. We've had months now to get contact tracing right. Order, As things order, stand, order, order. Member, please take a seat. I've asked the member on a number of occasions to please reference the legislation that is in front of us. This seems to be a speech and he has yet to reference in detail the legislation. I will give the member another chance. Pat Sheehan. Gormay, I've got a last count, Corda. Uh, and I don't know if we'll have the proper infrastructure in place that will allow us to ease the regulations that are being discussed here today. And moving on to the situation in care homes, despite the fact that we knew care homes were being impacted disproportionately by this virus, Little if nothing was done to protect the frail and the elderly in these settings. Shortages of PPE and lack of testing have been well documented. In London, research which used genome tracking found that temporary care workers unwittingly transmitted COVID-19 between care homes as cases surged. This tracking research into the behaviour of the virus in six care homes in London found that in some cases, workers who transmitted coronavirus had been drafted in to cover for care home staff who were self-isolating expressly to prevent the vulnerable people they look after from becoming infected. So why, why is that important here? Because agency workers here are also moving about from care home to care home. I spoke just yester yesterday to a senior manager uh, from a number of care homes who is extremely worried about this. In some cases, care homes have refused to take on agency workers, but as a result, their, their own staff are becoming overworked and overstressed, and they're reaching a stage now where they're have, going to have to consider bringing in agency staff. And if agency staff are moving about from home to home, uh, if that doesn't increase the risk of infection, I don't know what does. And it's no coincidence, a Kion Korla, alas, Kion Korla, that uh, there has been quite a significant outbreak among staff in Muckamore Abbey of COVID-19. Uh, to me, it's no coincidence that a number of agency staff there uh, moved from a care home in Belfast, which was seriously affected by COVID. In the name of humanity, I'm calling on the health department the Public Health Agency and the regulator of care homes, the RQIA, to get their act together and put a focus on our care homes that has been absent thus far. I stand with the Human Rights Commissioner, with the Commissioner for Older People, who are both on the public record as saying that not enough has been done to protect our frail, vulnerable and elderly population. 
uh, uh, Alas Kankorla, uh, I welcome the moves that have been made in easing the restrictions, uh, and I look forward to other easing of restrictions, but not until the proper criteria are met to save lives and protect our citizens. Can I encourage members to reference any comments they are, they are making to the legislation that is in front of us today? They may well mis wish to make statements on a number of issues, but it is not relevant unless it's referenced to the legislation which we are debating. Uh, I now call on Martina Anderson. Um, every time I, I come here to speak on the coronavirus restrictions, I take a look at the number of people who have died across the world, which today stands at over 320,000 people, with over 2,000 having died across this island. And I want to send my heartfelt sympathy to the families of all those who have died. And we are still dealing with the same deadly virus that we were dealing with eight weeks ago as we stand here today to talk about the easing of restrictions. And the World Health Organization has cautioned against lifting the lockdown measures prematurely, stating clearly that it could lead to a resurgence in the virus. A virus does not become a pandemic by itself. Our behavior spreads the virus and Unlike the fires, these restrictive regulations that we're discussing today, which are without doubt, which has been made reference to draconian, they have saved lives. This legislation in the five-step program announced by the executive last week is the correct and the cautious approach, with measures only being relaxed when it is safe to do so. So I welcome the measures that have been announced and how they are being taken forward. And over two months ago, however, and I want to concur with the last speaker, Pat Sheehan, because over two months ago, the North stopped community testing. The relaxation of measures that well before um, we were dealing with the, the number of deaths that unfortunately we're dealing with today. And the World Health Organization advice and advice at that time was clear. Test, trace and isolate. And despite this island being an epidemiological unit, we have not fought this virus on an all-Ireland basis. And the restriction of movement as outlined in the, re in the legislation, with no one being allowed to leave home without a reasonable excuse, unfortunately, did not prevent the transmission of this deadly virus, where we knew, we all knew where it would spread, namely in care homes. Ministers, I know as you come here today about the easing of the restrictions, that you don't have responsibility for the remit on, uh, uh, that resides within the Department of Health or for uh, devising the policy of testing. And I know that. Yep. I'm grateful to the member giving way. Before I ask her my question, I must point out this is becoming a bit of a pattern of one party in the executive lashing out all around them and attacking other parties who are working together to try and get us through this crisis. My question is this. The Deputy First Minister last week said that the target should be 0.5 for the R rate before easing restrictions. If the Chief Medical Officer tells us that the R rate is 0.5, will her party support easing restrictions? As you know, all of the parties around the executive are taking advice from what the Chief Medical Officer said, what the World Health Organization has said, and all of the advice that is out there. And I'm sure that collectively that the Executive will make the right call when it is safe 
to do so and they will ease the restrictions when it is safe to do so. I'm sure the member has got constituents coming to him as they're coming to me and to others uh, in Sinn Féin expressing their concern that we might be actually easing these restrictions too soon. People are concerned on both sides and I share what you said about people getting frustrated, uh, about being imprisoned at home. Uh, no one would support these draconian measures. But as I said to the first and uh, the joint first ministers here last week, you know, the measures that they're putting in place and the five steps that they have outlined is walking us through a process when it is safe to do so. But please do not say that this is about one party taking a slap at anyone. This is about giving expression to deep rooted concerns and you do not have your finger on the pulse of what people are thinking and feeling and have experienced outside if you think that that's what we are doing here. So don't think that and I would advise the member to maybe get more involved Can I ask that all remarks would be made to do that. Through the chair, please? And I, I try and again, I draw okay, chair, members back to the legislation. Saying, please come the restrictions the of the measure of, of the of the movement as outlined in the legislation, uh, with no one being allowed to leave home without a reasonable excuse, unfortunately did not prevent the transmission of this deadly virus where we knew it would spread namely in care homes. And as I said to the ministers, I know it's not your responsibility with regards to the health department and decisions that the health ministers take. Uh, he has got his autonomy and he has to take his call. I know it was not the executive who made a decision to stop community testing. But I can tell you in my constituency of Derry, questions have been asked around why community testing was stopped. And there wasn't an explanation given when we're hearing about the easing of these restrictions. We haven't got an explanation, despite the fact that the chair of the health committee tried to find out what the explanation was, despite questions being raised by public health experts like Dr. Gabriel Scali and others, despite members of the health committee trying to find out. So it's right as we stand here today that these COVID restrictions are reviewed every 21 days. And it's right that we're getting the information that we receive about the easing of those restrictions. I just only wish that there had been an inbuilt review to determine the impact that stopping community testing had on our ability to track this deadly virus. And yesterday we heard from the health minister and he announced a rolling testing. Now, it's not in the easing of these restrictions, uh, but I'm assuming all of that is being talked about how we move this forward. And he talked about rolling restrictions for all care homes and all care home residents in the north, with a senior medical advisor stating that this was being done sometime in June. Now, whilst I welcome that testing for all is finally going to happen in care homes, I cannot help but thinking that it's too little, too late. And as we stand here today to talk about the easing of the restrictions, I'm very mindful of the fact that as of the 8th of May, 269 people so far have died of this virus in our care homes. Yet testing of all residents, it's not going to start today. It's not going to start tomorrow. It's not going to start next week after we hear of restrictions being lifted. It's going to start sometime in June. June. Over a month and a half ago, I raised the need to save lives, like the lifting of these restrictions are still doing. They're going to save lives. And I raised the, the need to do that by testing all residents and staff in Owen Moore Nursing Home in Derry, following an outbreak there. Because testing, tracing and isolating every suspected case of COVID is essential 
for helping to control the spread of transmission and to save lives, just as the easing of these restrictions are still have that at the forefront of what's going to happen. Some nursing homes had only flimsy masks for PPE, and some told me that they had received what they described as a decree over the phone that if COVID-19 spreads in the home, then you are on your own. So whilst we're here talking about the easing of restrictions, and the phrase still rolls off people's tongues, we're all in this together. It's even written up in lights as you drive along the motorway. We're all in this together. Well, that's simply not true. If you're a, work, a worker on a low wage, but you're regarded as a key worker, if you're a porter in a hospital or a domiciliary care worker who's listening to the easing of these restrictions and who were aware of how the legislation that was being put in place to save life, but you didn't have the proper PPE and you were left more exposed to possibly catching the virus, then you don't feel like we were all in this together. The truth is, we never were. The legislation refers to the capacity of health and social care. What about the capacity of the social care sector to protect their workers, their domiciliary care workers, carers in nursing homes, who, were, who are clapped and applauded every Thursday night, but who were left anxious and some felt abandoned as the restrictions that were put in place to save lives did not seem to protect their lives. People working round the clock on the front line morning, noon and night to take care of the elderly, the vulnerable people in our community. Yet, if they fall ill from COVID-19 and if they have to self-isolate, then they are entitled to nothing more than statutory sick pay. So carers expect this legislation that we are talking about and the easing of these restrictions, but the legislation in place will do right by them, will do right by vulnerable old, older people, will protect all of us in society together equally. At the end of March, after the legislation was in place, before we were coming to a point of talking about easing these restrictions, but we were talking about the need to keep these restrictions in place and why it was important and how we needed to ensure that we saved lives and we knew where the clusters were going to develop. I wrote to the Minister of Health. I wrote to his permanent secretary. I wrote to the chief medical officer. I phoned and I wrote to the, to the Western Trust. I phoned and I phoned and I phoned the RQIA. I wrote to them too. I spoke directly with the older persons commissioner. I pleaded with them all to use their influence to get all of the residents and own more care home and staff tested in order to isolate the virus, but to no avail. Weeks later, weeks later, we got those who were symptomatic tested. And nearly a month and a half after that, we finally got all the care homes residents in the north will be tested. We're told that yesterday, but it won't be until sometime next month. So as we stand here today to talk about these and of restrictions and the restrictions that were put in place to save the lives of people, we need to think about how those frontline workers that we clap every Thursday night, how they have been feeling for all of, this, all of these weeks. We had the evidence and the analysis relating to clusters of COVID-19 in February. We knew it would hit care homes. And what was the response? Not the easing of restrictions, restrictions being put in place. The response was to stop community testing. So now as we stand here today and we're slowly and carefully lifting the restrictions, 
And as we do so, people are asking, at least some people that I'm talking to are asking, if deaths could have been prevented in care homes, if weeks ago the application of universal testing had been in place. There is no doubt that we need to proceed with caution, as has been said by the Minister in this chamber today. And the legislation and the executive's five-step plan does just that. But we need the five steps to be accompanied by universal testing and tracing and an isolation regime. No one likes our civil liberties, as has been said, been taken away from us, and we all want them returned as soon as it's safe to do so. No one wants a second wave of this deadly virus either. People's compliance kept the numbers of deaths down. And people who did that rightly expect the executive, especially the Minister of Health, to do everything in his power to prevent the R rate, whatever that is, in terms of uh, we know where it's standing now and how we're moving out of the restrictions, but they want the R rate to be prevented from rising. And that means test, test, test. Whilst the relaxation me measures we're discussing here today are low risk, the best way to prevent a second wave is by simply finding out where the virus is. You cannot avoid a virus if you don't know where it is. It's not rocket science. And this can be achieved by reinstating community testing. And I just hope that we don't have to wait until the end of June or later for that to happen. Go in, Margaret. I call Matthew Tull. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I rise, like others, to support, um, to the extent that it's relevant, the, the legislation that we're discussing today. Slightly in a state of bewilderment, I have to say, having heard um, a succession of DUP and Sinn Féin ministers rise to appear to take pops at different, verse, different parts of, the execu of executive policy, given they, those two parties lead the executive, but I won't dwell on that. Um, indeed, indeed. Um, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, specifically in relation to the legislation and the, and the regulations that we're discussing today, um, I think Christopher Stalford, who's now left the chamber, said earlier on that these uh, um, represent an enormous infringement on our civil liberties. Indeed, Martina Anderson just said that in her previous remarks. That is, of course, true. It's worth acknowledging that um, what the Northern Ireland Executive has had to do, what jurisdictions everywhere have had to do, is something that no one could have anticipated whenever these institutions reformed at the beginning of the year. It is an extraordinarily difficult thing to tell people that they basically have to shut down large parts of their normal lives, that society and, economy, uh, society and the economy um, cannot continue in the way that it is. That is an extraordinarily difficult and complicated thing to do. It's particularly difficult when uh, you have a unique set of governance arrangements such as we have in Northern Ireland where we have a mandatory coalition and uh, a multi-party executive. It is true to say, and I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks that there were some comments from different parties that um, were slightly, slightly belied the fact that there are two parties around the executive. Having said that, I would say that um, there has been an improvement in terms of the coherence of executive communications. But my remarks, specifically in relation to today's legislation, are about the communications and less about the politics with a capital P. Uh, on Monday, we were told, uh, uh, yesterday, we were told by First and Deputy First Minister about uh, new easing of the regulations in relation to uh, golf and tennis uh, playing, in relation to family members meeting outdoors, uh, groups of people meeting outdoors, I should say. Today, we are specifically debating the changes that were announced. Uh, uh, several days ago around opening up cemeteries uh, and other outdoor premises. Um, a slight and unfortunate pattern has emerged, which is confusion among our constituents. Um, I'm sure many other MLAs have had constituents come to them and specifically ask, as I think Pam Cameron said in her remarks, am I allowed to do this? Am I allowed to do that? A certain amount of that will be inevitable, but I'm afraid it's slightly exacerbated by some of the means of communication that the executive office or the executive in general have gone about using. 
Yesterday's easings, for example, were announced by means of a press release. I, uh, as someone who used to work in government communications, have gone through the various channels of the Northern Ireland Executive in order to establish where there is a simple dashboard for someone who wanted to access the information, uh, where it is that they could find it. Could they find it on the Executive homepage? Well, they can't. They can find a news release or a news story about what was announced yesterday. There isn't even a, what's called an infographic to explain it to them. If you go on to NI Direct, which is the home page for the devolved institutions that's supposed to tell people about local services, how they access them, and contains a range of information about COVID-19. There doesn't appear to be, I may have missed it, I did give it a fairly thorough look, there doesn't appear to be any simple, straightforward um, uh, route or portal for ordinary residents, whatever their views on COVID-19, whatever the views of the restrictions, simply to go in and find out when can I play a game of golf, when can I do X, Y and Z. Now, this may seem like a pedantic point, but it's extraordinarily important when we are doing what we're doing, which is, as, party, as uh, members from multiple parties have acknowledged, uh, infringing on people's civil liberties for the purposes of managing public health and minimising death and severe harm to our society. People um, want information and they want to be told why certain restrictions are being put in place. Um, there's an old saying in... Um, uh, in communications which is show, don't tell. And I think that's, it's extremely important that we, when we are going through this um, process, that we explain to our residents and our citizens what, why certain easings are happen, happening at certain moments and what they are specifically allowed to do. At the minute, we're having, I think we're causing a little bit of um, uh, unnecessary confusion. Um, and some of that confusion is also, called, um, uh, is also caused, I'm afraid, by ministers going on um, on, on television programmes to give their own views about um, other things which could be eased. Angling, for example, we had a minister talk about that on, uh, on the same television programme I was on just uh, a few moments later. I was then asked why uh, I was then asked about executive incoherence over easings. That kind of thing causes confusion and it isn't necessary. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, while I agree with uh, many of the comments that previous speakers have made, uh, specifically around failings in terms of our ceasing contact tracing and testing earlier in Northern Ireland, which I think still hasn't been adequately explained, given that we, had, we were both earlier in the infection curve uh, on this island, and we also have a different demographic and uh, geographic profile. That is to say, we have a much more rural and dispersed population. It hasn't quite been explained to us why it was in our specific and discrete interests here to cease that and at the same time as England, or, um, which is a much a bigger and denser population. And, uh, so while I agree with some of those comments, I, I, in general today I want to limit myself to uh, remarking upon um, the communication of easings. Uh, and of can I encourage the member to reference the legislation far, which is in front of us? Uh, as I have done literally throughout my remarks, Mr Deputy Speaker, I don't think I can be accused of straying too far. Um, my purpose uh, in relation to today is to say, yes, um, let's continue to be ultra-cautious uh, and very uh, science-driven as we ease these restrictions and move to a new normal, but let's also explain to people exactly what we're doing. Let's De uh, junior ministers, if I could give you, through the chair, a suggestion today. Let's look at better communication through the channels, the online and digital channels that are available to us, because I'm afraid at the minute it's going out through slightly um, confused means. We can't just rely on the, on the conventional media. Important though that is, to do the job of communications for us. So that's my, uh, th that's my encouraging remark to conclude my, my own comments on today, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call on Alan Chambers. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, I must confess I thought I'd wandered into the wrong debate today, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, certainly uh, I would support the controlled relaxation uh, of the regulations, uh, provided they're always based on best medical and scientific advice. Uh, however, I would maybe express a word of caution. The one thing that we've got to guard against, all of us, is complacency. These baby steps are certainly not an indication that COVID-19 is beaten. It may still have a sting in the tail. And I would appeal for all those calling for more relaxation of the regulations that may affect a particular aspect of their lives to be patient they may be understandable, but I think that they are perhaps unhelpful. 
as they may influence others, that the virus is disappearing and that it is beaten. It is not. We must still exercise caution, respect social distancing, and good personal hygiene routines. We may have all helped to save lives, but I think we also have to realise that there are still many lives that could be lost uh, to this virus if we drop our guard. Now, I didn't uh, particularly want to deviate uh, from uh, the regulations, but certain remarks have been made in the House today that I think have to be addressed and have to be replied to. We heard uh, from the other side of the House the mention of exercise uh, Cygnus, which was an exercise conducted throughout the United Kingdom in 2016. And one of the recommendations that went out to all the corners of the nation was to consider increasing stockpiles of PPE to be able to deal with a pandemic just like this one. And at a recent uh, meeting of the Health Committee uh, where this was discussed, uh, the chairman uh, did uh, make a comment that we didn't in Northern Ireland react to the advice of that exercise and that in fact, I think his words were that our planning were uh, inadequate. I think that it is useful to perhaps recall who the Minister of Health was back in 2016 when that remark was made that the planning was inadequate. And also, I mean, a lot of criticism of the executive, but I mean, the party across the other side of the House have a number of members on the executive. I understood that the executive operated on collective responsibility, or that's the way it should be. It begs the question, have the Sinn Féin members of the executive been sitting on their hands when all these issues have come about, uh, when all these shortcomings have been identified? Were they sitting on their hands? Can Were I they sitting with their mouth closed? To the yep. legislation in, front of us? Uh, in terms of um, human rights, uh, I heard the Human Rights Commissioner mentioned uh, and I certainly hope that when the testing that is due to start in our care homes uh, in early June, I hope that the Human Rights Commissioner will be on hand to protect the human rights of those frail and elderly and confused people in our nursing homes who may not wish to subject themselves, nor their next of kin, subject them to what is a very unpleasant and evasive uh, test. Uh, I, I mean, I can't see a situation where we're going to go into nursing homes and literally hold people down as they are approached uh, by medical operatives dressed in full PPE. What distress is that going to cause to uh, frail and, and, and particularly people suffering from dementia? We need to be careful about this mantra of test, test, test in care homes. It may not be the most humane way forward, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And just in conclusion, can I just say that there is no doubt that the hurlers in the ditch have been out in force today. Thank you. I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Forgive my cynicism, but I must say that when I hear in this House two convicted terrorists, one talk about in the name of humanity, and the other talk about saving lives, and I'm afraid my thoughts go to the actions of those who performed the very opposite. And then when one of those persons, or maybe both of them in fact, devote their speech in large measure to, I was going to say a veil, but it was hardly veiled at all, 
attack on the health minister. And then invoke the phrase, all in this together. It's pretty clear that for some on this executive, they're anything but all in this together. I think those contributions spoke for themselves in that regard. In terms of what's before us today, I, as when it was announced, I very much welcome the alleviation in respect of graveyards. I still, though, have the fundamental question, why were graveyards ever included in the first place? Because the thought of one or two, more likely to be elderly than not, people making their way to a graveyard to sit or stand beside the grave of a loved one, ever posing a threat to anyone in terms of the spread of coronavirus is just hard to comprehend. And I'm glad that eventually the executive came to their senses and realised that that was an alleviation which had to be granted. It did in the meantime, though, as many of us as constituency members know, cause a great deal of grief to individuals who were prohibited from uh, performing those functions. Um, so that's the first portion of the regulation, which is welcome in all its parts. Um, then we have the amendment to Regulation 5, which seeks to clarify uh, the business of leaving your home for the purpose of exercise and underscores the necessity to have regard to all the circumstances. It is a matter of regret to me that when the original clause was introduced that we had from some police officers an overzealous implementation. I think of one case of a gentleman who, from Coleraine, who has health issues, he's not shielding, he doesn't have, but he has health issues of which he's conscious. He has a dog. Where he lives, the footpaths are very, very narrow. So every time he went out, he felt uncomfortable in terms of COVID-19 with how close people were having to pass him. So one day, having experienced that, uh, the next day he got in his car and he drove to the West Strand car park in Portrush, four, five miles away. He went to the extremity of the car park so he would be well away from anyone. And he went there because, as probably everyone in this house knows, the promenade at the West Strand is particularly wide, several metres wide. And he thought that would be a safe place for him to walk his dog. And yet, before he could even get out of his car, a police patrol came to his window, no PPE equipment, of course, demanded to know why he was there, when he sought to explain, was abruptly told that was no excuse. He was going to be issued with a ticket. Yes? I think I can probably top the member's example. A uh, case of a couple that I know were going to the shops in their car and asked by the police what they were going to their shops to buy. They said essential food items. The police told them that better be the case because we'll be checking on the way back. And on the way back, they were stopped. And the police rummaged through their shopping to make sure that there was you know, perhaps not a bag of Maltesers or something in there that wasn't an essential. Well, it makes the point. Uh, as the case of the man I'm referring to makes the point of an unnecessary, overzealous uh, approach to these regulations. Yes. And I would agree with his with sentiment in relation to Regulation 5.2 and the point of reasonable excuse. 
Because I take a look at the point, and I've realised this, that under this re particular regulation, it prohibits the exercise of non-farm animals, such as horsing, or what has come to my own attention in relation to pigeon racing, the ability for people to exercise their animals, applying social restriction to applicable distances. I have to say, Deputy Speaker, in my view, the pivotal issue in all this is social distancing. That has to be the fundamental protective. Uh, and therefore, when you examine individual episodes and ignore all of that, I think you are not delivering the purpose that the legislation exists for. So I do hope the fact that now it expressly says, having regard to all the circumstances, that we will have a more sensible approach to this issue. And of course, now that golf courses, quite properly, I believe, are to be open tomorrow, uh, that inevitably means that you can, it is a reasonable in all the circumstances to travel for the purpose of such exercise. So if someone is driving to the golf club of their choice, in the doing of that, they are no longer in breach of the regulations. And that's how it should be. And if Minister Putz delivers on what he said last week, that I think by tomorrow week he's reopening the car parks at the forest parks, then clearly, which I think is a good idea, plainly someone who drives to Tullymoor or Row Valley or wherever for the purpose of exercise cannot be in breach of this regulation. But it does throw up uh, some further complications. Because if a man drives to play his golf, and maybe he's a caravan owner in that particular town, drives to Newcastle, drives to Portrush to play his golf, and he's going to be playing two successive days, which he'd be entitled to do. If he's the owner of a caravan in the town, he's prohibited from staying in it. Now, why, why should that be? Yeah. And it's maybe just a, a technical point, but it's my understanding uh, that you can only play golf at a golf course of which you are a member. But there are many people who, for example, belong, have the privilege of belonging to some of the prestige golf clubs. You know, I know um, people from uh, Balamina who are members of Royal Port Rush. And uh, when they go to play golf, they'll be going to Royal Port Rush. Uh, likewise, there are people who belong in, in many other parts of the province. Um, the point I'm making really is that for regulations to be viable and sustainable, the need to have an inherent coherence, the need to make sense to ordinary people. Because the greatest danger in all of this, and the, Republic, the public have been remarkable in their degree of obedience, because as Mr. Stalford pointed out, these are spectacularly restrictive rest uh, regulations. Uh, there's something none of us should get used to. There's something that every one of us should want to lift at the first opportunity. They are so impeding of the rights of us all. So if you have regulations which have within them a form of inherent contradiction, then they the respect for them dissipates. And indeed, ultimately, they could fall by virtue of disobedience. So it's important that the regulations have that coherent element of common sense and logic to them. So I go back to the point about the caravan owner. And indeed, 
there are there's quite a cohort of people in this province. And when it gets to this time of the year, they just live for their caravan. They just love pottering about it, sitting outside it, etc., etc. And yet, take my example of the golfer. If he legitimately goes to play golf in that time, and he's going back the next day, he can't stay in his caravan. Why should that be? There's no logicality to that. And just want to mention, caravan owners. Now, I had a lady on the phone with me just a few days ago, literally crying about the fact that her caravan was her life. She wasn't going to party. She wasn't going to parade up and down the main street. She was going to socially distance, she hoped, at her pride and joy, which was her caravan. And this executive talks rightly much about mental health, about mental health champions. Well, I can tell you, it's becoming pretty manifest to me that for some people in that position, it is having a very adverse effect on their mental health. So I do say to the executive, it is time to weave into this approach greater humanity, uh, greater common sense on some of these issues. And Mr. Stolford rightly asked a legitimate question, and no doubt Mr. Vans will give us the answer. What is the R number today? And uh, where does it leave us? Now, last week at the Ad Hoc Committee, we were told it was seven. And um, when I asked the Health Minister, um, did he know anything, given what Michelle O'Neill had said, did he know anything about a requirement to be at 0.05? He told us, never heard of it. So that does bring us to the fundamental question. Are the leaders of the executive being driven by the science? Not Michelle science, real science. Are they being driven by the science? Or are there other agendas at play? Are there some who want to drag their feet on this? Are there some who are quite happy if the economy of this part of the United Kingdom suffers more damage? Are there? I'm beginning to think there might be. And indeed, on that theme, we were told last Thursday by the dear Minister, Mr. Putz, in the public media, that on Thursday the executive had advice from the scientific and medical officers on stage one, and we were good to go. Good to go on stage one, no qualification. Step one. And yet, of course, when it came to yesterday, we weren't good to go on all of step one. The in house meetings are still prohibited. Indeed, what was the message of yesterday on step one on going to work? Because I remind you what step one says. Encouragement to those unable to work from home to return to the workplace on a phased business basis subject to legal requirements and best practice arrangements being in place. I didn't hear a word yesterday if we were moving to step one, what that meant for returning to work. And my goodness, when you listen today and hear that unemployment in the month of April rose by 90%, that needs to be central to thinking of this executive, or we'll have no economy left. 
So what is the direction on step one in relation to encouraging people back to work? How are they being encouraged? Certainly. Would the member agree that um, I think basically no credible economist, whether they tend to be from the right or the left in any jurisdiction, thinks that there is any means by which you can simply turn the economy back on, not just because of, um, not just because of, well, not just because of COVID-19, because people are, are afraid of of what happens. They're not just going to go back out and shop and go to pubs and restaurants. Would the member accept that creating a simple binary between health versus the economy isn't accurate? It doesn't. Be, it's not borne out by economic evidence. To that, uh, but I do remind the member, the executive's matrix, which they published yesterday, said benefits of each amendment are considered in three domains: wider impacts on health, society, and the economy. And I'm, my complaint is, I see secondary or lesser or even absent for some consideration of the economy. And I'm making a plea that the economy is central to that decision, as this matrix says. Yes, I I never agree that while it's not a binary choice between public health and the economy, it never can be. The longer vast swathes of the economy are in stasis and not moving, the much more difficult it becomes to get it moving again, and that's the danger. Absolutely. Uh, and of course, um, the fact that it isn't moving, people are only surviving by virtue of the very legitimate, necessary government handouts, which are coming from the Treasury, as Mr Nesbitt pointed out. Now, that is not a healthy position to be in. It's not one that can continue indefinitely. Therefore, it's one that any responsible government putting in place all the protections, particularly the social distancing protections that can be put in place, needs to be encouraging of the restoration of economic activity. Because without it, there's nothing left after this pandemic in terms of our economy. And without an economy, what have we going forward? And it's not a, it's not a binary choice between good health and good economy. It's a sensible choice between resuscitating the economy where you can, as soon as you can, without imperiling the generality of health. But you know, the, let's remember, remind ourselves, the greatest threat from this virus comes not from the economically active. It comes from mostly the older uh, community. So restoration of economic activity is not something that flies flatly in the face of, um, uh, of dealing with COVID-19 uh, and identifying where the problems uh, and the growth in the virus is, is something that can be done in tandem with encouraging economic resuscitation. And I was disappointed that yesterday I didn't even hear the economy mentioned in terms of the press conferences. So I think these are baby steps that have been taken. I think they're necessary. Uh, I do question why one of them was ever in there in the first place. Uh, I welcome the fact that the, um, there will be some easement, I trust, in terms of uh, the exercise and the travel for that. And uh, I encourage the executive to go further in that regard. And I want finally just to pick up on a comment I heard the First Minister make this morning. Uh, I was glad to hear her say it. And I want to encourage the executive as a whole to act on it. And that was to allow small weddings. Uh, two, two people already today have been in touch with me in that position. Where, uh, had their license for marriage, the shutdown came, very anxious to get married, 
and find, no matter how small they're prepared to make their wedding, even if they're prepared to have it outdoors, they're not allowed to get married. Now, again, I'm back to the point. That lacks the inherent logic and common sense that should be there. So I do appeal to the executive, please act on that issue and on the many more issues that you need to act on. Thank you. I call Jerry Carl. Deputy Speaker, I just want to make a few brief points. And I think we're often presented uh, the executive as being uh, an image of unity. And uh, I don't know if today we got a glimpse of maybe some of the tensions and uh, divisions uh, that it normally exists. Maybe the junior minister can enlighten uh, us when he comes back on whether that was the case uh, today. Um, political questions were referred to, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, I think part of the problem uh, throughout this crisis is that we followed London uh, for too long and too often. Uh, the problem with that approach was that obviously London um, uh, preached and practiced the dangerous and ludicrous policy of herd immunity, but also suspended contact tracing. There was a lack of testing, slowness to acquire PPE, uh, to name but a few of, of the issues. But uh, to turn to the uh, measures before us today, well, I certainly, Mr. Deputy Speaker, do not oppose the measures provided. Uh, the provided there is safety ensured for workers, uh, in particular those who work in cemeteries. Cemeteries obviously are important for people uh, to grieve in. I think I would urge uh, caution, though, Mr. Deputy Speaker, about lifting too much uh, of the lockdown restrictions uh, so soon. I think the key issue at the heart of all this uh, is what happens when large numbers of workers go back to work. We have witnessed in South Korea, Germany and Italy and other countries when restrictions have been lifted, that there have been new clusters, new cases, uh, and that is the risk that is before us. We cannot rush uh, to lift measures of lockdown, risking all the sacrifices that people have made and the possibility of more deaths. And I note that the Health and Safety Executive in March uh, they stated that they have seen almost a 2,000 per cent increase in complaints in March. I, I, have, I hazard a guess that that's a lot higher today. We obviously saw the tragic case of a worker dying uh, in Moy Park, and there are still concerns over health and safety uh, of workers and how they're going to be protected. And I don't think the executive has been clear or robust with a plan to say how that uh, will be the case and how workers will be uh, protected. The health and safety executive uh, recently received at least 480 complaints. But there is 28 staff who can inspect uh, sites. So I want to ask the, the junior minister what measures. I've asked this question, I think, three times on the floor uh, of the assembly. What measures will the executive take to ensure that workers are protected, especially as new measures uh, to lift the lockdown are put in place? Thank you. And I call Jonathan Buckley. Speaker, and again, I, I will be brief. Uh, while welcoming these regulations coming into effect. Um, I think this was one of the most sensitive areas of these regulations to date. And I remember the last time the junior ministers joined with us in the House, uh, it was a point in time to discuss the need to um, change regulations to allow those grieving families the opportunity to grieve at peace uh, at the gravesides of loved ones. And I remember the emotive stories, both from uh, Mr. Nez, but Mr. Alistair at that stage, and myself. And I, I was glad that not only the issue in relation to burials, but we also that same day implored movement upon waste restrictions. We also implored for action upon immediate exercise in parks and urban settings, all of which has been achieved. And I, I think that has to be welcomed. And we have to note that uh, on those points, we, we, we watched how an executive listened to members, considered their concerns, and edited regulations and brought into effect uh, certain measures to allow for these simple solutions. But it has been mentioned here today, I think, by Mr O'Toole, and I think it's, it's an important point in relation to communications around this, because I think we all can testify to the fact that the pace of change, which I welcome, I welcome phase one as introduced by uh, the First and Deputy First Minister and the Executive on Monday. Um, but with that point, the pace of change is not corresponding directly with the pace of change with regulations. And while there, while there is that mixed messaging in relation to those changes, we run the real risk of losing the people on this. Because they are now 
considering and taking it into their own opinion, well, does this rule or this statutory rule or regulation apply to the common sense formula in my head? And for many of them, they're questioning some of the, the actual uh, particular part of regulation which has limited their ways of life. So I, I think it is important that the executive junior ministers take on board the point that there must be a, a, a clarity in relation to regulation changes that keep a pace with the changing scene uh, and announcements made by executive ministers. Um, it has been mentioned earlier, and I think this is a very important point, that some of the regulation changes have had such a devastating impact on mental health. And I, I think we, we can all testify to the fact that some of the pursuits and ways in which some people in our society find enjoyment are far, more far-reaching than we could ever have anticipated. What's one person's cup of tea may not be somebody else's, but we understand the need for them to find these outs in life uh, to ease the mental pressures that they're facing. And I particularly want to, uh, the regulation before us talks about changes to Regulation 5, as was alluded to by Mr. Allister, and that is the reasonable excuse point of the legislation. And I think this particular point runs the risk of public opinion racing ahead of it, and I think this has to be taken into consideration. Mental health can, can cover all different pursuits. It doesn't have to be your own personal exercise, as is mentioned in the regulation, because we know that for, for a lot of people, they find um, that form of exercise and that mental therapy and relaxation in other sports. And I, I have mentioned it earlier, and I, I will again, but I think in particular to the pursuits of outdoor activities, whether that be walking, climbing, uh, or country sports such as shooting, etc., these are all things in which, if we, apply the, if we apply the common sense formula, should be permitted under regulations. And I, I look particularly, as I've mentioned, and I know the Agriculture Minister has before, uh, uh, seeking clarity on this ma matter and hopefully a regulation change in relation to Regulation 5.2, paragraph 38, uh, which does prohibit the exercise of animals non-farm animals. And I, that can go from horses to, in my own case, the sport of pigeon racing. This assembly may take note that the sport of pigeon racing is something that is widespread practiced across Northern Ireland. But to date, these members are unable to even exercise their birds because of the reasonable excuse element of, reg of Regulation 5.2, which excludes their exercise of animals. Now, I would implore the junior ministers to take this point up upon the executive to ensure that a common sense approach can be applied and that something like this can be changed uh, with relatively no effect, because I think that's one thing that has come to light, is that some of these regulations um, I suppose when they were introduced at the start, they were draconian, as has been mentioned, and I think members are now fully coming aware to the fact of how draconian they are. And it's not something that should ever sit comfortable with anyone. But we have actually got to see the real fabric of our society and what the interests, hobbies, uh, therapies, etc., are for many people within our society, whether that's cross community or elsewhere. It really is, we've seen the depth of society. But we must keep the people with us in this. Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, thank the member for giving way. And, well, the member agree with me that one of the benefits uh, of the executive's plan to come out of uh, the coronavirus lockdown in, in, in a stage way is that we have the review points in it. Some argue for very rigid dates, that we would have rigid dates and A, B and C would happen on certain dates. But the member raises the point around, around pigeon racing, and I too have been lobbied in relation to that subject. The executive plan allows for flexibility where we can raise issues with our executive colleagues and they can go away and review them and come back with decisions based on scientific advice. But I think it is welcome the fact that we can and the executive can review on a constant basis and the process allows for uh, implementation of safe activities based on scientific advice.
correct, and by and large, I would agree, because if, if we reference the earlier points such as burials, uh, access to urban parks, and also indeed refuge, these, these are issues which were brought before the Assembly floor. Their points was heard across this chamber, and we did eventually see changes to that regard. Um, but the main point would be, while there is no fixed and rigid dates, we must therefore then see a speed of action from our executive colleagues to implement the changes in regulations to keep a pace with the changing environment via the phased approach introduced by the executive. So I do look forward to continued conversation with executive ministers and indeed the junior ministers to discuss how we can implement and change regulations to keep a pace with society and the changing cultures and viewpoints, therefore, because we have to apply common sense. We have to realise that there is a mature society in Northern Ireland that can look upon simple sporting activities or otherwise, can exercise their right to do such hobbies in a socially restricted manner and at no stage be a threat in relation to coronavirus. We must take that point on board and I look forward to further engagement with the ministers on that regard. Thank you. I now call on the junior minister, Gordon Lyons, to conclude and wind up the debate on the motion. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I uh, welcome today's debate and thank members for the contributions uh, that they have made. Uh, can I also take this opportunity to uh, thank the Assembly Secretariat for all the work that they have carried out um, that has meant that we can continue to meet here and that the Assembly can continue to discharge uh, its scrutiny role? We have been able to do that, uh, obviously, uh, in a safe way, and we're in a, a very fortunate uh, position in that regard, of course, to a great many people. Uh, life is far from normal at this time. The battle against COVID-19 has turned the world uh, on its head uh, and, and on a scale that no one could ever have foreseen. It is a battle that has played out right here and now, and we all have work to do in order to combat this virus. But that work has paid off. At the end of March, when the restrictions and requirements contained in these regulations came into effect, the scientific modelling suggested a reasonable worst-case scenario in the region of 15,000 deaths. However, that estimate now, and largely as a result of those regulations, is only a tenth of that figure. That is a considerable achievement and provides the clearest possible evidence that the regulations are working. The regulations have saved many lives, and I commend the way um, that we as a society have adhered to them. However, whilst the regulations have been very good at doing what they were designed to do, stopping the spread and incidence of the virus, we must not forget that the potency of the measures uh, um, means that they also have some serious side effects in terms of how we live our lives and go about our business. I never uh, would have believed that such restrictions would ever have been needed, or indeed that they could ever be made to work. However, it is also uh, very important that we keep a close watch on the damaging side effects that come with the regulations. They have resulted in an economic and social crisis. I do not underestimate how difficult a time this has been for our people. I have had business owners on the phone with me in tears, concerned about the future of their businesses. I have heard from people who are desperate to see their children and their grandchildren again. I have heard from people who have expressed their anxieties, uh, their fears, and expressed the fact that they are, are feeling lonely because they have not been able to interact with other people. We must not, therefore, become complacent about the restrictions and requirements imposed by the regulations. They must not be allowed to become the norm. It is imperative that we do not allow the damaging effects of the measures to be allowed to continue for a moment longer than necessary. Although the statutory requirement is for a review of the measures at least every 21 days, the reality is that the executive is reviewing them on a constant basis and will not hesitate to make changes um, immediately if the science and expert evidence allows for that to happen. In fact, it is actually required by the, by the regulations themselves. That is why 
when it became apparent that it would be possible to ease the restrictions on access to burial grounds, the Health Minister moved to introduce the amendment regulations we have been debating today, 12 days ahead of the next formal review point. The publication last Tuesday of the Executive Approach to Decision-Making document means there is now a blueprint for the review process uh, and the incremental structure for assessing uh, progress contained within the document will help uh, speed up decision-making in key areas. And that is why on Thursday last week and again yesterday, the Executive was able to make a number of informed decisions based on expert advice to further ease restrictions in response to prevailing local circumstances and needs. And there will be more relaxations to come in the days and weeks ahead as we ease our way forward on the path to recovery. Now, I would like to turn to some of the points uh, that members have made uh, today, and not unexpectedly, um, given the, given the um, gravity of the subject and the all-pervasive nature of the measures contained in the original regulations, it has been uh, a wide-ranging debate and, in some cases, an extremely uh, wide-ranging uh, debate, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I will try uh, and touch on all of the key issues related to the regulations um, that, uh, that have been, been raised. Uh, first of all, um, I want to uh, thank um, Mr McGrath for his uh, acknowledgement um, of the positive benefits in regards to the opening of, of cemeteries. And, and I do agree with him, and those points were made very powerfully here uh, by members uh, in the chamber in relation um, to the mental health um, benefit that it would be to allow people um, to go and to visit the graves uh, of their loved ones. Uh, and I'm, uh, I agree with him also that, and I think Mr Alistair had raised this point as well, that it's the social distance, distancing uh, is the important thing. And it, it is the key to our success uh, as, we, as we move forward. Uh, I understand also um, the desire that he has for clarity uh, in regards to um, issues as they are announced. Um, that is not going to always be easy. Uh, it's not going to be easy for us to um, anticipate every single um, scenario that may uh, come up, um, but we certainly will do all that we can to provide um, the, the advice uh, that people are, are looking for. He also mentions the over 70s. And obviously, there has been uh, guidance and advice that has been given to those that fall into the, to the vulnerable category. Uh, however, I would remind uh, the member um, that the regulations themselves do not restrict um, the movement or activities of those that are in the over 70s category. Uh, rather, it is advice from the public health agency uh, that they need to take uh, extra care. And I want to make sure that we can do everything that we can um, to help them to return to their normal lives as, as soon as possible. But the key in all of this is reducing uh, community um, transmission, uh, and we need to do all uh, that we can to help uh, in that. Uh, the chair of the Health Committee, Mr Gildernew, uh, had said, um, uh, had made a number of points, uh, and I just want to emphasise uh, to him, and for the benefit of the Committee in the House, the uh, health Department has been working closely uh, with the Health and Social Care Board and the PHA to clarify UK guidance, uh, enabling people with autism or a learning disability uh, on how they can leave their home for exercise, uh, including travel beyond uh, their home. And that guidance was placed on the PHA website on the 6th of May. Additionally, I can advise that a template letter has been shared by the Health and Social Care Board with each Health and Social Care Trust for use by families upon request in support of such uh, circumstances. And correspondence issued by the Department of Health to the Assistant Chief Constable on the 7th of May asked that this would be drawn to the attention of PSNI colleagues. Uh, and the PSNI is currently applying a reasonableness test to determine whether travel can be justified uh, in any given uh, instance. Um, this is uh, reasonable uh, and, and a pragmatic uh, approach to enforcement uh, in relation to uh, this issue. Um, in terms of the comments from um, Pam Cameron, can I uh, thank her and echo uh, the comments that she has made in relation um, to the Chief Medical Officer and the Ch Chief Scientific Officer uh, and their teams? They have been um, uh, under a, a huge amount of strain, uh, no doubt. They have a very difficult uh, and demanding job. 
and I know that they have um, carried out their work diligently uh, and in a way that we're all um, very, very um, I'm proud of. Uh, and it is right that we put on record uh, our thanks uh, to the CMO, the CSO uh, and their teams. Uh, of course, I completely agree with her also uh, on her remarks in relation to funeral directors uh, and uh, I commend them for their um, sensitive and professional engagement with, with bereaved families uh, as well. We have um, been asked questions uh, a lot today uh, in terms of when can I do X or when will we be allowed uh, to do Y. Uh, and I can assure uh, all members that we will not uh, retain these me measures any longer uh, than we have to. And I think it's worth repeating that in making decisions, the executive will consider three key criteria. The most up-to-date scientific evidence, the ability of the health service to cope, and also the wider impacts on our health, society and economy. And when we can, um, we will make sure that people uh, know about this as soon as, as soon as we can and give them certainty so that they can set out um, uh, their plans. In terms of uh, Mike Nesbitt's uh, comment, Mike Nesbitt um, did a very uh, rare thing uh, in this chamber. He, he made a, a brief and succinct uh, point. Um, I uh, congratulated him on recognising that brevity uh, is not a vice. Um, and obviously, uh, I think it is important to, to acknowledge that, um, as the Finance Minister announced today, we spent or intend to spend over £1.2 billion pounds, um, in relation to actions to help with the effects of COVID. Uh, of course, um, the vast majority of that has come from, from the Treasury and also um, uh, an unknown uh, amount of resources come as a result of the, of the job retention scheme. Um, so it is important that we acknowledge that we have been able to use the resources that have been provided to us uh, to help uh, our people, and I hope that we, we all um, are, are pleased and, and, and can agree um, about how um, we have been able to help our citizens uh, in that way. John Blair had made um, uh, comments that obviously I completely agree with and endorse that it is the citizen's behaviour um, that has led us to this point, uh, and that is the key to defeating uh, the pandemic. Uh, we're only going to be as effective um, if people uh, adhere to uh, these regulations. By and large, they have been, have been uh, and I want to thank people uh, for that um, and, and for doing uh, their duty. In relation to the other point that he raised, Minister Swan signed a declaration on the 15th of May to designate district councils as an additional enforcement body for the purposes of regulations three and four. And a set of amendment regulations also made on Friday included provisions to allow councils to issue prohibition notices and fixed penalty notices. I understand that PSNI and councils are discussing joint working um, to operationalise future enforcement uh, and to clarify rules. Uh, Christopher Stolford um, made comments that I'm sure that we will all uh, agree with, uh, or I hope that we will all agree with, in terms of wanting uh, to live in a free society. Uh, and, and of course, this is extremely uncomfortable for me uh, to have to stand here uh, and ask uh, for regulations like these to be brought in in the first place. I understand the effect that it's having um, on our freedom um, that we have, that we have freedom that was that was hard won uh, as well. Um, and that we can't exercise that at this time uh, is, is very difficult. In relation to the um, lifting of restrictions, I can confirm to him um, uh, that we listen to the, the, the chief medical officer, we listen to the chief uh, scientific officer. Uh, we have the matrix now in place, and the information is fed uh, through that, uh, and then we get the information back as to whether or not um, some, uh, we can relax um, some more uh, of these uh, restrictions. Um, obviously, this, the details that he has asked for uh, in relation to specific numbers um, are a matter for the Department of Health, but I do think it is important to, to note that when we're discussing the R number, uh, it's not just where the R number is on any one day. Uh, it has to be the trend of where it is at. Uh, and even if there is no change in the R number, that doesn't mean that we will be prohibited, uh, of course, from, from changing regulations. Because as long as the R number is below one, 
um, then there is a reduction overall in the transmission uh, of, of the disease. Um, and, and that's what we want to see, see more of. But of course, um, the approach sets out that it's not just about the R number, it's overall, it's the evidence um, of uh, an analysis of medical and scientific advice combined with the capacity of the healthcare system to cope along uh, with the wider impacts that the regulations are having. All of those things are taken into consideration before we decide uh, to relax um, the, the restrictions um, that are there. Uh, he made specific points uh, in relation to uh, worship. Uh, I understand um, that in the case of churches like uh, his own, I think it's Ravenhill, um, that he mentioned uh, it may not be possible for them to conduct drive-in uh, church services. Um, I, I understand uh, very much uh, that um, there are many people that are doing uh, online uh, services, of course, and I know that that is no substitution uh, whatsoever um, for, for public assembly and public uh, gathering uh, together. Uh, however, where we are able, where we are allowed to, to relax restrictions, that's what we're doing, and I hope very much soon the evidence will show um, that we will be in a position uh, where, where churches can reopen uh, for, for public worship, and, and I look forward um, uh, to that day. Um, Pat Sheehan, um, I, I welcome his support for the executive's strategy and agree with him on the need for, for measured, thoughtful and evidence-based uh, approach. Uh, and like his colleague, uh, Ms. Anderson, he raised a number of operational matters relating to the management of the disease. He will appreciate these are not matters uh, for the legislation, um, but I will certainly ask my colleague, the Minister for Health, um, uh, I'll certainly uh, let him know um, about the comments that he and his colleague, uh, Ms. Anderson, ha ha have raised. Uh, Mr O'Toole rightly uh, emphasised the need for clear uh, and straightforward communication uh, to citizens. I do think it would be helpful uh, if we could get, as we move through um, the, the, the process, that we could have some graphic which shows where we are, perhaps in each sector and, as in some cases, within each sector on each stage. And um, like the regulations themselves, um, we will keep that uh, under review uh, and continually look for ways to, 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 um, to improve that. Um, uh, Mr Chambers um, said that COVID-19 is, is not beaten yet, and that's absolutely uh, the case. Um, but it won't be beaten by restrictions alone um, uh, either. Um, it's going to um, have to, to take place. Um, whenever we are working together and trying to combat uh, this disease and following the restrictions. Um, and I completely agree with him on, on what he has said. Um, he did mention a specific point in relation to testing that there are some sensitivities that need to be addressed. He's absolutely right. There are human, human rights considerations that we need to be um, conscious of uh, as well. Um, there may be residents that um, do not want to consent to be tested or may not be able to consent um, to be tested because of um, dementia, dementia or other illnesses, and those considerations have to be very carefully uh, considered um, uh, and, and, and in a sensitive way, obviously, uh, as well. Uh, in relation to other comments um, that were made, um, I just want to pick up on a few things that, that, that Mr Allister uh, said. In terms of uh, enforcement, I think it's regrettable. Um, that those uh, issues that, that he and uh, Mr Stalford raised, that, that those took place. Um, I think that we are in a better place now. Uh, I believe that the police um, are, are more aware of their, of their responsibilities um, uh, as well. It is obviously a matter, an operational matter for, for the PSNI, but he has put those on record today. And I hope that the changes that we are implementing in the regulations today uh, will lead to less um, of that sort of, uh, of enforcement. In relation to the, to the caravan issue, I do have, have sympathy and I have many constituents who have also contacted me uh, in relation to this issue and I, I understand the mental health benefits as well that can come from being able to be uh, in, in your caravan and the, the, um, that issue will be assessed based on the scientific and, and medical evidence along with the other benefits that, that it might bring. At this stage, we're not in a position um, to bring in those uh, regulations. I understand the, the, the anomaly, uh, anomaly that he, he has raised uh, in, in relation to this, but of course, if we were to say, uh, if you're going to play a round of golf, uh, you can go and stage your caravan, there will be lots of other people that might say, well, why is he allowed to go there, uh, but I am not. So we have to look at these things in the round, but I understand uh, the, the points that he, he made in relation to that, and also the point uh, that he made in relation to um, looking at the science uh, as well. It should not be for us 
um, as politicians to, to, to give uh, scientific advice if we do not have those qualifications. Uh, I do, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, have an AS level in biology, um, but that I do not think qualifies me uh, to make any judgment, and Mr Allister seems to, to agree with me uh, on that. So we will leave that to the experts, um, and we will take uh, their advice and follow their advice uh, at all times. In terms of encouragement, uh, back to work. We certainly have um, moved along the stages uh, in terms of, of moving from um, work, certain aspects of work being permitted to, to those being encouraged. Um, we're grateful for the work of the engagement forum that has set up guidance to show people how they can um, get back to work um, in, in, a, in a safe way. And um, we um, uh, certainly uh, encourage um, uh, that to happen and, and, and thank, thank the group for their work as well. Obviously, the um, economy minister has said that she's going to bring forward an economic recovery plan uh, as well, uh, which, which we welcome. Uh, he also mentioned a specific issue in relation to um, the other part of stage one that we, that we didn't uh, go through. Um, the, the advice on Thursday is the same as the advice that we got today, is that it, that it is not currently safe. Uh, or sorry, it is not currently uh, uh, considered acceptable uh, to move into the family members um, mingling in, inside uh, at this stage. Uh, we had hoped that it would have been. Uh, I certainly would like to be able to uh, visit my family uh, again, and I, I hope that they want me to, to visit them. Um, but we're not uh, in that place uh, right now, uh, and so uh, we have to wait. But that, was, that, was, that decision was based entirely uh, on the scientific evidence uh, that was provided that was provided uh, to us. Um, some people have asked, why do we not have dates within um, uh, the regulations? Uh, or, or why is it that some parts of stage one are moving forward and, and others aren't? Well, it's because um, it's the regulations that we have to adhere to. And the regulations state, as soon as any restriction is not necessary, then the health minister must terminate it. Uh, and so we wanted to terminate um, the regulations on, on part of stage one rather than, than moving together uh, all at once. Uh, finally, uh, he mentioned uh, small weddings. And, uh, I completely agree uh, with him on that as well. I think the key, the key thing will be uh, social distancing, obviously, but if a couple want to get married in a small group, um, I would like to see that happen. And again, we have asked the chief medical officer and the chief scientific officer uh, to look into that, and, and hopefully we can move uh, to, to that position. Um, we also had uh, Mr Carl, uh, who had... Um, uh, raised again uh, health and safety concer concerns. Could I again draw his attention uh, to the extensive guidance that has been produced um, by the health and safety executive, the PHA, the, the engagement forum um, that was established also by, by, by Minister Dodds? And don't forget that we already have robust uh, health and safety legislation. Uh, it already exists, and the enforcement authorities will take their responsibilities uh, very seriously. Uh, and the member. Absolutely. Thank you for giving way. Um, just for his attention, the, <coughs> the Belfast Telegraph on the 31st of March said the First Minister and Deputy First Minister said those firms not enforcing health authority guidance could face tough action. Does he know of any or how many companies have been uh, subject to tough action as a result of not following health and safety measures? I don't have that information available, but I'm more than happy to ask the uh, Department for the Economy, if they could write uh, to the member uh, in relation uh, to that. Um, but the member will be aware that the Health and Safety Executive has undertaken um, an, a number of unannounced inspections on, on high-risk uh, uh, premises, and I, and I hope that that will, will continue. Um, finally, then, uh, Mr Buckley mentioned public opinion running ahead of the, of the regulations and also a range of, of outdoor activities, such as, as pi pigeon racing. The regulations, I've said before, could not possibly cover uh, every possible activity, um, nor do they, they, they need to. And I would point members as well, when considering the, the, the plan, uh, I would draw their attention to the definition of steps at the bottom of the, of the second table. Uh, and that will give um, the, the current position um, of where we are uh, within the process uh, and the basic principles that need to be applied. Um, we can't cover every single um, scenario, but we hope that that guidance 
um, gives, uh, or we, we hope that those words give a little bit of guidance towards that. But of course, if there are if there are specific issues that want, people want clarity on, uh, no doubt they will contact their their representatives or or ourselves, and we will be happy uh, to to answer that. Um, it is important that a common sense uh, approach is applied um, uh, to this. Um, but this executive can and will review a range of activities. But the risk, um, but this must be based on the evidence and an assessment um, of the risk. Uh, as well. So, in conclusion, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would say to members that there will be further um, uh, regular debates in the weeks and months ahead as science and expert advice allows for more amendment regulations to be made cont containing further relaxations across key areas. However, that will only be possible for as long as we are winning the battle against COVID 19. Uh, but, Mr. Prince, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we are not without hope. We have begun our journey back to normality, and we are moving in the right direction. And I know that many of us want to go farther, but the easiest and fastest way for us to get there is to adhere to the rules that are in place now. And as noted previously, we are in the strange position of seeking assembly approval for legislation that we want to see repealed uh, as soon as possible so that we can get on with tackling the challenges that will come with the next phase of the crisis and which are fast looming. The challenge of strengthening our resilience in a world where the virus remains prevalent. The challenge of rebuilding our economy. The challenge of restoring health and social care by investing in its capacity and, above all, investing in its brilliant people. And on that note, I would like to take this opportunity once more to pay tribute to all of our health and social care staff. They are true heroes, and I say to every one of them, thank you. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you for what you continue to do. Uh, and thank you for making our health and care systems uh, so great. These regulations have also had a huge impact on the elderly and most vulnerable in our society, and it has been extremely encouraging to see communities rally behind them. So I want to place on record my thanks to all those community organisations, sports clubs, faith groups, cultural groups, lo the loyal orders, who have done so much to make sure that those in need are taken care of. Mr Deputy Speaker, we look forward to the days when we can further relax these regulations. We aren't there yet, but we make a start, and therefore I commend the regulations to the Assembly. Thank you. Members, the question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Regulations Amendment, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I would ask members to take their ease for a few moments when we change the staff at the table.